All right, well, um, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Tuan Hoang and uh, you know, uh, uh, it's very, I know that it's a little tiring for at least for probably most of us during the day, but um, I am glad uh, to have this opportunity. Um, I have gone to ACTC, uh, you know, almost every year since I began working at Pepperdine uh, about eight years ago. And, uh, you know, and it is nice to, 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 to do it again, even on Zoom. Um, uh, you know, especially after having missed it last year. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so what um, I have communicated with the panelists and we agree, you know, to um, present in order, in chronological order of, of you know, text and authors, you know, and so uh, basically, you know, and I will also ask, um, you know, each of us presenters to just, you know, introduce ourselves, uh, our affiliation, uh, you know, and, uh, maybe say a, a little bit about, you know, why we are, you know, giving the paper or presenting the paper that we are doing, you know, just for contextualization. Um, you know, and I ask, you know, uh, we to like to, um, I, I, I mean, I, I have, a, I have a, my, 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 my time or my cell phone time or here, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and I, I was, I asked uh, for maybe like between 12 and 15 minutes, you know, um, uh, if, if, if uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, try to manage that, right? Because we, we, we like to leave time for discussion as well. Um, and I think it's usually the case anyway, but, but in case, you know, you are like close to 15 minutes, I'll just like wave my hand or something like that you know, to say that you have like a couple minutes left, uh, you know. Um, so, um, all right, so the first person to go is uh, Natalie. Uh, a paper actually that could have been, uh, you know, um, uh, at the beginning or at the end of this panel because it, it has to do with Aristotle as well as Hannah Arendt, but, you know, since it's Aristotle, somebody got to go first, right? So, uh, Natalie, please, uh, turning to you. All right, thanks. I am going to see if I can share just that one tab. Let's see if that likes doing that. Natalie, did you hit record? I did, thank you very much. <laughs> I did a little early just so uh, we wouldn't have any problems. Okay. Well, sorry, one moment. I'm trying to get it to where I can both read my paper and uh, talk to you guys. And I don't know if that's going to work. So instead of uh, doing the slideshow, which wasn't that helpful, I'm just going to jump right into it because here we go. Got 12 minutes. I've already spent one of them trying to make the slideshow <laughs> work. So, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, as Tuan said, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Natalie Moreira. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Dallas here in Irving, Texas. Um, like I said uh, earlier, I think whenever, before everyone got here, maybe as you are arriving, um, just a heads up, I'm also going to be keeping an eye on the tech issues. That doesn't mean that I'm a tech expert by any means. It only means that I went through a single training session in order to learn how to mute and unmute people. So, um, you know, if, if you see me uh, staring at the chat box, that's what's going on there. Um, my research interests include conceptions of glory, reputation, and leadership, ancient, modern, and beyond. Um, also, sorry, I'm losing my place. Um, ancient and early modern political thought. I think that's lots of folks here. And uh, especially uh, the thought of Hannah Arendt, who, I'll be writing my who I'm writing my dissertation on right now. So uh, this presentation grew out of what will become a dissertation chapter on Arendt's relationship to Plato and Aristotle. Um, but I will admit that it's preliminary and exploratory, meant to stir up conversation rather than answer some any huge questions definitively or anything like that. So that's the good of ACTCs that we can chat about these things. Um, I will warn anyone that's too excited by the abstract uh, that you'll find my talk rather disappointing. <laughs> I had to choose between the exciting high points and the reasonably demonstrable in 15 minutes high points, and I sadly chose the latter. <laughs> but uh, by the end, Aristotle's philosopher will still be solitary, and I'll have just begun to sketch uh, Arendt's position. Uh, honestly, when I get to the time limit, I'll just sort of trail off and we'll pick it back up in the, the comments if possible. Um, so I apologize ahead of time for any uh, illusory 
strings that I haven't quite weaved back in. Uh, also, before beginning in earnest, I'd like to note that for Hannah Arendt, uh, there's nothing that can take away a person's humanity. As a German Jew who fled Germany in 1933, the year Hitler came to power, uh, after being arrested for researching anti-Semitism, Arendt is keenly aware of the existential dangers of debating the humanity of a person or a people group. So when I discuss relationships or in my abstract talking about comparisons between uh, a solitary person and a beast, it's really important that we remember, uh, uh, I don't mean to suggest that those who find themselves unpolished uh, are, they sink in dignity or equality or anything like that. So just a very clear statement from the beginning. But preliminary caveats aside, let's begin. Our purpose is to offer some preliminary thoughts on a comparison between Aristotle and Arendt on the question of the solitary person. One of the key insights of Arendt's book, The Human Condition, is that the philosophical tradition that begins with Socrates and stretches to Nietzsche places the contemplative life in a hierarchy over the active life and has blurred important distinctions between different kinds of human activity. She outlines the three kinds of activity as labor, taking care of the necessary things to stay alive, work, making a durable world to house human life and give it context, and action, free deeds and speech that reveal the distinct uniqueness of each human person and relate them to one another in a public realm. All of these activities are most properly situated within the human community, but it is conceivable that both labor and work could be done alone. Since labor is activity that metabolizes itself, things like eating, doing laundry, um, doing the dishes, you've always got something, you know, you're always wearing clothes when you're doing your laundry, at least you hope you are, so it's a continual process. Um, it's possible for a person to engage in labor alone since it metabolizes itself. It's what you need to stay alive. Uh, however, says uh, Arendt says that this person would be an animal laborans in the most literal sense of the word, which is to be a working animal. Um, the person continuing her biological life through whatever means uh, at her own disposal and without any products from or relationship to any other human beings would be living an essentially indistinguishable life from an animal. Um, so the private realm is, is, is communal. There are things that happen with one another, but it is, uh, uh, it is possible for you to work, to, or to labor, to continue your life and to work, to, to fabricate alone, but you are missing something. We'll return to those thoughts at the end of the talk though. Um, we can begin to, uh, to turn to Aristotle to begin. And we'll, like I said, we'll, we'll reference er uh, Arendt again at the end. We can begin to unveil Aristotle's contemplative paragon, the philosopher, by starting with his cousins, as it were, the boar and the insensible man. Aristotle is terrifically unclear when he writes about the insensible, the anesthesia, in his Nicomachean Ethics. In the first mention of the insensible human, he is compared to the boorish or rustic, the agroikos in Greek, meaning one dwelling in the fields. The agroikos, it seems, does not take pleasures as he should. And in this way, he is like the insensible. Aristotle writes, similarly, he who enjoys every pleasure and abstains from, none, abstains from none becomes licentious, but he who avoids every pleasure, as the boorish do, is a sort of insensible person. It is worthwhile, then, to identify this type of person, the boar, in an attempt to better identify the insensible person, we'll talk about later, in an attempt to better identify the contemplative persons. These people, we can kind of flesh all of them out by their similarities, by the family resemblance, like I said. Uh, the boar is rustic. He is not at all concerned with civility or sophistication, and he consults only himself. He is not capable of distinguishing one pleasure from another, and he stands out most clearly in terms of play. Uh, quote, as for what is pleasant in times of play, he who is in the middle is witty and the disposition wittiness. The excess is buffoonery and he who possesses it a buffoon, while he who is deficient is a sort of bore in the characteristic boorishness. This passage refers to what is pleasant in times of play after dealing with the middle term for telling truth and before dealing with the question of what is pleasant in the remaining part of life. So what is pleasant, period. Uh, boorishness does not come through in every aspect. For example, the pleasant in life as a whole is friendliness with the extremes of obsequious or flattery on the one hand and surliness on the other. The boar is not surly, not quarrelsome, and not even commonly identifiable, it seems. His deficiency in play is what gives him away. The middle term seems to deal with changing in the correct way for the situation at hand. Quote, but those who are playful in a suitable manner are called witty, as in those who are versatile, since such witticisms seem to be movements of their character and characters like bodies are judged by their movements, end quote. The boorish then must be the other extreme, the, the not witty. 
the one who does not change the situation, even when it is called for. He's something like the cartoonish caricatures of bespectacled Bible thumping old men set too firmly in their ways and refusing to make accommodations for the moment at hand. Uh, an example that I, I always like to give is that the residents of Beaumont in the movie Footloose, they're not going to be dancing and darn it if you do. <laughs> in the second mention of this type, Aristotle identifies the boorish man through his deficient relationship to humor yet again. Quote, those who are excessive in provoking laughter then are held to be buffoonish and crude, intent on doing anything for a laugh and aiming at more at producing laughter than at saying something seemly or not causing pain to the person who's the butt of the joke, so they go too far. On the other hand, those who would say nothing funny themselves and who are disgusted with those who do are held to be boorish and dour, end quote. The buffoon is constantly shifting to fit the mood in order to foster certain pleasant feelings in those around him. On the other hand, the boorish man is disgusted by this behavior of the buffoon. Again, Aristotle points to the feeling of disgust, or in Greek, the inability to bear, to stand. So uh, less disgust, like, ew, that's gross, and more just, I can't be around that. Um, so Aristotle points to that feeling of disgust at open reverie as an identifying feature yet again. Quote, the buffoon cannot resist, who cannot resist a laugh, sparing neither himself nor others if it will produce a laugh. And saying the sort of things a refined person would never say, and some that he would not even listen to. The bore is useless in these sorts of associations because contributing nothing to them, he is disgusted with everything. The bore is disgusted at the virtuous mean, wit, and the, at the vicious excess, buffoonery. So he's disgusted at both the, the good thing, the middle thing, and at the other extreme. He just doesn't like anyone. This confirms that his distaste for jokes is not an overdeveloped sense of refinement, but a discomfort with the flexibility necessary to put people at their ease. What makes him turn away is not a concern for modesty or pride, but rather a, a shudder at the permeability of decorum. He is sensitive to those interpersonal movements. He sees that they're happening, which will be important later when we talk about the insensible person, but the boar holds himself apart from them, whether or not they're appropriate. He's settled in his own self and refuses to move. Further, Aristotle categorizes the boar among those who cannot be persuaded by reason and who are motivated only by desires. He says, the obstinate are not persuadable by reason when they take hold of given desires, and in fact, many of them are led by pleasures. Obstinate types are the opinion, oh, I'm sorry, let me start that again. The obstinate are not persuadable by reason, when they take hold of given desires. And in fact, many of them are led by pleasures. There we go. Obstinate types are the opinionated, the ignorant, and the boorish. The boorish being in the class of the obstinate prefer their own opinions to any others and will act according to those opinions even when it becomes difficult to do so. So they're quite determined, but also uh, they're going to be the only ones who determine what they're determined to do. They're not going to be paying attention to what the situation calls for because it doesn't matter. They're standing in their own right. Now we can turn to the insensible person whom we will give short shrift because the paper is gonna bump up against the time limits even so. <laughs> Aristotle gives us the middle term between, oh, like no, bumping up against the time limits. Here we go, moving faster. Aristotle gives us the middle term between the painful and the pleasurable. Uh, as moderation, and the extremes are licentiousness and insensibility. Licentiousness, achalasia, is an overabundance of pleasure seeking, and insensibility would be a deficiency of the same. Moderation deals with the particulars of enjoying a pleasure, the how and when and where and what kind. An insensible person, then, because he is removed from any enjoyment, is barely present in the world at all. In book three, we read about those who are slack and caring for the appropriate things. Quote, the activities that pertain in each case produce people of a corresponding sort. This is clear from those who take the appropriate care with a view to a contest or action or whatever, but they are continually engaged in the relevant activity. They're building themselves up for the specific activity. To be ignorant then that the corresponding characteristics come from engaging in a given activity is exactly the mark of someone who is insensible, uh, end quote. The insensible person does not perceive that action in the world gives rise to change in the soul. He is removed from the physical world and the interpersonal world by not experiencing it in its sensual fullness. And because of this, he is ignorant of the in intimate connection between the soul and action. The insensible person cannot be easily changed and will naturally prefer his own opinion, not because he is stubborn like the boar, but because he has no motivation to change. The boorish man digs in his heels and refuses to be moved, but the insensible man does not even feel a tug that could be compelling. 
is incapable of feeling that pleasure. The second reference in the ethics to the insensible person notes his dispassionate character concerning pleasures and pains, not all of them and to a lesser degree with regards to pains. The mean is moderation, the excess licentiousness. But those who are deficient when it comes to pleasure do not arise very much. And thus people of this sort too have not attained a name, but let them be called the, the insensible. He expands in the very next chapter saying, in some cases, it is the deficiency that is more opposed to a given middle term. In some cases, it is the excess. It is not insensibility, which is deficient, but rather licentiousness and excess, which is more opposed to the moderation. To moderation. Just spell it clearly what Aristotle is saying here. Sometimes the underuse of a capacity is closer to having the virtue, the right use itself, than the excess use of that capacity. In the case of moderation, being insensitive, i.e. not using the capacity of pleasure taking or, or feeling pleasure as much as one should, is less bad or closer to moderation than licentiousness is. Sure, it would be worse to be licentious than it is to be unwilling to feel pleasure at all, but the latter is still not a fine use of the capacity. In other words, still not a virtue. Again and again, Aristotle is emphasizing both the lack of pleasure and the lack of desire for pleasure. Pleasure does not move the insensible person outside of himself in any way. He is as stubborn as the boorish man without ever being pricked by the desire to move. Um, so we're saying they're rare because I'm pushing up on my time limit and I'm not gonna make Tuan wave me down. I'm gonna skip some stuff. Um, let's jump quickly to the contemplative person. Two minutes, thank you. Jump quickly to the contemplative person and then I'll wrap up with some rent. Uh, now that we've sort of taken a look at the insensible and his cousin, the boorish, we have to briefly turn to the contemplative person who's the third in our, our sort of uh, cousins of, of solitariness. Um, the connection between the insensible person and the contemplative is all but explicit in the Nicomachean ethics. We have seen that someone deficient in sensuality is not in a natural position for the human. Um, so we saw that earlier. This is not natural. It's not normal. It's so rare that he barely has a name for it. Um, Aristotle writes of the contemplative as well, brief quote, the activity of the intellect, because it is contemplative, seems to be superior to in seriousness, to aim at no end apart from itself and to have a pleasure proper to it. But a life of this sort would exceed what is human, but it is not insofar as he is a human being that a person will live in this way, but insofar as there is something divine present in him. End quote. Neither the insensible nor the contemplative appear on the human stage. While the contemplative is beyond human in a way that is explicitly divine, Aristotle leaves the insensitive person without a category to rest in. From the above passage, we see that the one significant difference between the insensible person and the contemplative person is that the contemplative person does experience pleasure in a, of a certain kind. The activities bound up with thinking differ from those related to sense perceptions, and they differ from one another in point of form. So too then do the pleasures that complete them. Each pleasure is closely bound up with activity that completes it. Uh, that's again a quote, I guess you'd noticed from Aristotle. <laughs> the activity of the contemplative man, as we know, is the activity of speculative thought, whose right and wrong functioning consists in the attainment of truth and falsehood respectively. That is the activity of speculative thought, is that is the activity of speculative thought is discovering the truth simply. And though the attachment of truth is indeed the function of every part of the intellect, it's more important for the contemplative, for the uh, uh, speculative intellect than the practical one. And I'm gonna skip ahead again, and I'm gonna summarize so that Tuan doesn't have to kick me off. The resemblance between the contemplative's abstraction and the insensible person's lack of embodied experience remains, even though the uh, contemplative person does have a pleasure natural to him. Uh, they still are both cut off because of what the, the contemplative person's uh, activity is. It is a non-sensual, it is a, uh, an, an, inter, an intrapersonal rather than interpersonal activity. Um, both of these people are cut off, all three of them, honestly, because the boar stands apart, are cut off, are, are, are not properly human, according to Aristotle, um, which is odd. We'll talk about that. I'm sure people, I hope, will, will push on that, um, that the philosopher, the, the paragon of the highest virtue, uh, is somehow so similar to someone who is, uh, barely exists on the human stage. This is something that Arendt is very grumpy about. Um, she has a, a lot of admiration for Aristotle, for the tradition, um, and she doesn't doubt the validity of the experience that led us to, to, to uh, split the world into these two parts, the contemplative life and the active life, um, but she's against the, putting a hierarchy of, contempla uh, of contemplation at the top of the hierarchy, because it leads us to um, 
mix up all of these ways of being together in the world into one sort of gray, dull blur. It's there's con contemplative and then there's active, which is everything else. So I will stop there because I'm already two minutes over and no one waved at me. <laughs> ask me more questions. Let me <laughs> you are good. You are good. You know, I, I apologize to to um, Natalie and the panelists and others too that you know uh, actually the plan was also to have you know maybe after each paper to have uh, you know up to three minutes in case anyone have any question about that paper, paper specifically uh, you know and then we will move on to the next one and, and then in the end we usually have time when we can you know uh, go all over the place um, uh, you know throughout the, the, the entire panel but we um, I, I forgot about this partially because you know the ex experience show that right the first couple of papers always like get the least uh, <laughs> mentioned by by the AM so uh, do you any any anyone here have have any question for Natalie? Please go ahead, speak. Unmute yourself. Charles, if you, yeah, there you go. Hi. Uh, could you say a little bit, bit about um, Aaron's grumpiness? Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Tuan, wave at me if I talk too long. I, I won't be offended. <laughs> um, so, Though, so I, I have this in a pretty slideshow that I couldn't figure out how to make work. Um, Arendt agrees with Aristotle that um, the best life is not is one that we uh, choose freely. Um, it's not one that is compelled by necessity. She would, uh, thinks um, the the most characteristically human life or human activity, I guess, is more specific than life because you have to do the things that are necessary too. But the most characteristic human activity is in fact one that is uh, not chosen because it's useful or necessary. Um, it is in fact one that is freely chosen. Um, what she gets grumpy at Aristotle for is uh, discovering with Plato or following the tradition with Plato and Socrates that we have this capacity for theory, for uh, contemplation, for um, um, thinking about the still um, steady state sort of cosmos and thinking because this um, this seems to fill some higher activities that the human being has therefore it's the very best thing possible and everything else has to be secondary to that so when you do that when you make that move where um, uh, uh, because this is a cool feature everything else is secondary to it what you do is all of the human activities that are interpersonal that that Plato or that Aristotle spent the whole first bit of the book describing they all get sort of blurred in the shadow of this cool new feature of theory of contemplation of being able to um to to have this divine presence so her grumpiness is well no there's something that's that's characteristically human as well that is active that is interpersonal. Um, I, I had a, a joke in my, my slideshow kind of, you know, if, if Aristotle in the, the famous painting of the School of Athens is pointing down, um, saying that every, you know, things are uh, matter and form here together, uh, uh, Arendt is pointing sideways at each other. Um, it, th these things are only discoverable in the characteristically human activity of disclosing ourselves to one another and co-constituting um, what the human experience is by doing it together. So our grumpiness is you you found the, the top of the mountain and now you're just gonna hang out up there by yourself and miss all of those characteristically uh, human divisions and actions that happen interpersonally. Thank you for letting me uh, jabber Thank on you. a little more. All right. Any follow Thank up you. if there's no other question. <laughs> Yeah, we will definitely will, you know, have time for everybody. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, continuity, let's move on to our next speaker, Jamie. Uh, please introduce yourself. And uh, as soon as you begin the paper, I will click the 15 minute. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, and, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm gonna try and uh, share my screen. I have um, some slides with a few bullet points to complement what I'm saying. So tell me if that is working. Yeah. Thumbs up? Good? Great. Okay, well, I will, um, so I'll just introduce myself. So um, I'm Jamie Boulding. Um, I'm at Stanford University. I'm a uh, postdoctoral research fellow in theology and science. I'm interested in the relationship between uh, science and religion. Uh, I'm originally from London, England. Uh, my um, 
uh, did my PhD at Cambridge, also in theology and science, have a book coming out later this year with Routledge on uh, multiverse theory and theology and, and how that relates to the science religion relationship. Um, but I'm here at Samford on a two year uh, Templeton postdoc and um, uh, exploring the relationship further between uh, science and religion. And I'm also teaching on Samford's uh, Great Books program, uh, which is how I got uh, interested in, 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 in this conference. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to um, present on uh, Julian of Norwich, who is one of the uh, thinkers and texts that I taught last semester. And that got me interested in Julian of Norwich. It got me thinking about uh, Julian of Norwich's, you know, incredible modern relevance, I think, to what we've been going through in the last year with the pandemic, uh, particularly uh, on questions related to solitude and suffering. And that's just what I'm going to talk about very briefly. Uh, today, I'm going to keep my comments, um, uh, keep my thoughts as, as brief as possible. Um, and I'm very happy to elaborate on more either immediately following this or later on uh, in the question time. <clears throat> So hopefully you can see the, the second slide there that's changed. So just to um, introduce Julian of Norwich as a figure for people who may not be uh, that familiar with her, she lived from uh, 1343 to 1416, roughly. Uh, we think there's some debate over that, but you know, we're talking about the um, uh, you know, mid to late 1300s going into the 1400s. And she's a central figure in the uh, medieval Christian mystical tradition. And so mysticism here refers to the direct union of the soul with God through contemplation and love. So in 1373, while she was severely ill um, and believing herself to be on her deathbed, uh, she had a series of intense visions of Christ. Uh, the visions began um, when she received the sacrament of extreme unction or, or last rites, and they continued until she recovered from her illness. And so in 1393, some years later, uh, she wrote a theological exploration of the meaning of these visions of Christ and how vivid and powerful they were. And, and this provided the basis for her book, Revelations of Divine Love. And that's the text that I'll be uh, focusing on and talking about uh, today. Uh, and Revelations of Divine Love is, is often referred to as the first book written in the English language uh, by a woman. So historically uh, very significant there. And throughout the text, uh, Julian uh, demonstrates not only um, you know, very deep theological knowledge and understanding in relation to issues like uh, God's nature and the doctrine of the Trinity, creation, sin, prayer, all of these big theological ideas, um, but also more importantly, I think a capacity for a very strikingly original theological thinking and, and concepts and language of her own. Um, and this includes discussion of um, Jesus Christ as a, as a mother. So referring to Christ as a mother, as somebody who embodies the qualities of motherhood. And I can say more about that uh, later maybe. Um, and the text also includes very vivid descriptions of Christ's faith, face and body, um, including the suffering he endured. And she has lots of imagery of his blood and wounds. Um, and this is because Julian's vision offers a, a God who is inseparable uh, from man and woman. Uh, a God who is radically transcendent and distant on the one hand, uh, but also bodily incarnate on the other hand, and therefore intimately connected to other embodied creatures, other humans just like us. Um, so with that brief background in mind, um, in this paper, I'm gonna just briefly discuss the contemporary relevance of Julian's theological vision uh, within the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which is the uh, focus area of, of this conference, I believe. So I will uh, just examine two questions, uh, her response to solitude and isolation, which she understands as an opportunity to turn inward to God, um, and also the ways in which she finds meaning in uh, Christ's suffering and death. Um, and finally, I'll offer some brief reflections on the value of teaching this text, Revelations of Divine Love, uh, to students during our own time of pandemic. Uh, so just the first point on uh, solitude, hopefully you can see that slide on solitude. Um, so as we know, you know, with the spread of COVID-19 and all the social distancing restrictions, lockdowns, quarantines, uh, the public health interventions, many millions of people around the world have experienced the pandemic primarily as a time of solitude and isolation. And so in addition to the um, uh, large scale transition to online modes of living, and interaction, including online worship, online working, online learning, which is what we're doing right now, 
Uh, we've also seen more attention on, on the health risks of, of isolation and solitude as well. So, you know, within this modern context where everyone is focusing on solitude, isolation, loneliness, um, I think it's, it's interesting to consider the example of Julian, who herself lived a life of solitude devoted to prayer and contemplation. So in 1394, she became an anchoress, um, which means someone who withdraws from secular society and enters into an enclosed solitary life in a fixed place in order to focus on prayer and the achievement of greater spiritual perfection. So this practice emphasizing individual forms of devotion became increasingly popular in late medieval England and um, apparently more anchorites and hermits are recorded in Norwich in England than any other uh, medieval English town. So Julian lived in a cell on her own attached to St. Julian's Church in Norwich, which is a city in the east of England. Um, to live as an anchorite was not necessarily to escape life, but on the contrary, to try to enter into it more fully by focusing solely and entirely on God. So in this context of extreme isolation, she turned inward to find God. And we see an inward turn to God in so many great texts throughout the ages, thinking about Augustine's confessions. But the difference here is, is, is Julian's emphasis on interiority is her choice to occupy a literal, physical environment of isolation. So just on this subject of, of interiority turning inward to find God, she divides the human self into two parts. Uh, you have the outward side, which is our physical nature, our bodies, and you have the inward side, which she defines as exalted and joyful and vital, all peaceful and all loving. So in her view, our inward side, our, our interiority is superior since its goal is eternally set, eternally set on being united to Christ. She explains that the inward side governs the outward side so that by the power of God, both might be made one. So in this sense, Julian illustrates how we might think of the solitude associated with the pandemic as an opportunity to cultivate one's interior life of prayer, contemplation and spirituality with the goal of deepening one's relationship with God. And more broadly, um, and from the perspective of liberal education more broadly, you know, this shift in perspective need not be applied strictly in terms of religious belief. We might consider that the interiority um, encouraged or perhaps enforced by solitude and quarantine is also an opportunity for constructive and focused uh, personal growth and development more broadly. So that's um, Julian of Norwich on solitude. Uh, just to say a few words about Julian of Norwich on the related question of suffering. Um, so of course, in the past year, the pandemic has um, generated an immense um, degree of suffering around the world. Something like uh, close to 3 million deaths have been attributed uh, to COVID-19. Uh, making it one of the deadliest pandemics in history. And in the United States alone, uh, more than half a million people um, have died as a consequence of COVID-19, according to these statistics. So in light of these tragic uh, modern developments, uh, we might consider that Julian herself lived during the worst pandemic in human history, referring, of course, to the Black Death, uh, which um, was in the, the kind of uh, mid-1300s, 1348, 1350, the Black Death was a bubonic plague pandemic, which is estimated to have killed uh, somewhere around 40 to 60 percent of the entire population of England. So amidst the pandemic of her own time, she records in, in Revelations uh, that she prays for three things. Knowledge of Christ's passion, one. Bodily sickness, two. And to be able to receive three gifts, the gifts of contrition, compassion and longing for God. And in particular, she focuses on the significance of Christ's redemptive suffering and death. She finds meaning in the idea that, as she puts it, the most high and most worthy was the most fully humiliated and most utterly despised. She believes that Christ's suffering means that ours will be turned into supreme and eternal joys. So in one of her revelations, in the eighth revelation, she insists that, and I'm quoting now, we must endure discomfort and hardship with Christ. He suffers because it is his will and goodness to raise us even higher in bliss. In exchange for the little that we have to suffer here, we shall have the supreme unending knowledge of God, which we should never have without it. The sharper our suffering with him on the cross, the greater our glory with him in his kingdom. So of course, this is a 
you know, she's advancing a familiar Christian argument, but within the very particular context of her own pain and isolation and the pandemic that she uh, lived through herself, the idea that present suffering in the here and now will ultimately be uh, redeemed. Uh, so just in the time I have left in the last few minutes, just like to conclude with some brief reflections um, on the value of this core text of revelations of divine love to liberal education uh, in the time of COVID-19, once again, thinking about the theme of the conference. So, you know, I believe that, that Julian's revelations of divine love um, is extremely meaningful and compelling core text to teach during a pandemic. Um, actually, let me, there you go, there's the final slide. Um, so I've already discussed the, the ways in which he very imaginatively and powerfully explores these two themes of solitude and suffering, which I've said a little bit about uh, in this talk, uh, which are both newly relevant uh, and universally relevant within our own pandemic context. Um, she offers her own profound reflections on the meaning of solitude and suffering, which are at once deeply idiosyncratic, distinctively medieval, and also highly applicable to our own time. So she has a very uh, distinctive and original writing style um, using the imagery and the language descriptions of Christ and Christ's suffering. He's, in many ways, she's a, she's a very medieval figure um, who embodies this medieval uh, sense of devotion, religious devotion and prayer. We can talk more about that. But at the same time, uh, some of the ways in which she advances these ideas are very modern, not just in light of the COVID pandemic, but also ideas about Christ uh, being a woman or being described in female terms and with female um, attributes. Um, and I would also add that even for students who might not share her own religious perspective from different or no faith traditions, um, there are ways in which to relate her, experience, her experiences to more modern and secular concerns. So, you know, for example, here's just one example, her decision to live as an anchoress in a cell could be seen as kind of a, you know, medieval version of Virginia Woolf's Room of One's Own, uh, Virginia Woolf, Room of One's Own, another um, essay and, and text that, that we teach here on Sanford's Great Books program. So this is the idea of a space in which a woman uh, especially could find privacy and scope for personal growth that might not be possible in other environments. Um, so obviously Julian is within a religious medieval context and this idea has continued to be updated and revised in very different modern and secular contexts as illustrated by uh, somebody like Virginia Woolf. Um, and so on that point, I think Julian's text, teaching this text provides a lot of rich opportunities for students to consider more general questions uh, beyond the pandemic, beyond religious belief. So questions related to freedom, autonomy, individuality and intellectual and spiritual development. Um, and just to, to, to conclude, in my own experience of teaching the text to undergraduates in the last few months, um, I found that they were really receptive, highly receptive to the relevance of her life and her work to our pandemic experience, um, her clarity and originality of thought and language, and her fundamentally optimistic message of hope and redemption amidst widespread solitude and suffering. And I believe that that final point, the possibility of hope and personal or spiritual development is, um, can be particularly important and meaningful uh, for students who've been enduring unusually challenging educational experiences throughout the pandemic. I think that's about 14 or 15 minutes, so I will stop right there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, you actually, you still have two minutes left, but that's okay, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, so yeah, please, um, anybody have uh, uh, time for one or two questions specifically for Jimmy? I had a question, uh, uh, just asking for clarification, Jamie, did you say and did I read correctly that she actually prayed or beseeched uh, God to make her physically ill? Yeah, so, um, so sorry for the pause. Um, so yeah, one of the, um, this, is, this is really interesting and, and kind of um, very important in terms of framing her whole text and her whole vision. So in, in um, introducing and, and framing revelations of divine love, she, as I mentioned in the talk, she asks for uh, three things in particular. She wants knowledge of Christ's passion. Uh, she wants to receive the gifts of contrition, compassion, and longing for God 
And yes, the third thing, as you said, is she actually wants to receive bodily sickness. She's actually praying um, for the, for the, I was going to say praying for the opportunity, but that sounds weird, but praying for bodily sickness, praying to receive bodily sickness. And I think this um, relates to this idea of suffering and the kind of meaning and importance that she attributes to suffering. You know, the idea that um, just as Christ suffered on the cross and that redemptive suffering is what can give us hope and, you know, a sense of purpose and destiny, ultimately, that, you know, humans also here uh, in the here and now, um, you know, we can, we can suffer, we do suffer. Uh, we obviously suffered during uh, the COVID pandemic. She lived in a time of great death and suffering and plague. And she also felt like experiencing extreme forms of suffering herself and sickness would give her more of an insight into uh, Christ's suffering. So bring them closer together somehow. Um, and also uh, just the idea that whatever suffering that we as humans may experience um, on our own level, that it's as nothing compared to the, you know, the suffering uh, that Christ endured on the cross. That's one of the uh, points that she highlights in the book. So while on the one hand, you know, suffering can, can give us kind of a sense of, of, of Christ's suffering and, and bring us closer to God, it also reminds us how kind of radically uh, different and distant we are. Um, and that's also one of the big themes in the book, the idea that God is kind of simultaneously radically transcendent and distant, while at the same time, uh, intimately uh, linked to us and connected to us and and she explores that through this focus on you know bodily suffering both on the part of humans and on the part of, of Christ. <clears throat> One more question anybody? Oh, Are you to Natalie? No no I, I just had a clarification question so Jamie, uh, she became an anchora, anchoress, anchoritis, an anchorite, that's what we're gonna call it. Um, anchoritis sounds like a disease. <laughs> then the plague, then the the revelations or how, what, was the, what was that chronological order one more time? Yeah, so she, um wrote the um ex so she she was she was sick initially she wrote um the about her sickness and her visions in 1393 and then in 1394 she became an anchoress so it's i mean it's it's pretty it's all pretty compact and close together it's kind of a continuous series of events there's the, the chronology um you know there there aren't kind of you know sharp or, or meaningful differences as such but um yeah and it's um I guess that the term is the general term is anchorite, but I guess because she's female, it's anchoress. So she, it, you can, <laughs> can use, yeah, it, it can go. But, but the trajectory is is towards uh, more solitude. Yeah, as that's, it goes that's right. Yeah, that, that's okay. right. Yeah. So so yeah, that was something that she did. You know, following mm -hmm. sickness and um, you know, in kind of the middle part of, of her life, I guess she would have been um, thirty or, or heading into her early thirties. Um, at that point in her life. So yeah, she she made the decision to become an anchoress and to attach herself to, to this church in Norwich, um, hence the name Julian of Norwich. Um, and yeah, it's a really, you know, interesting idea that it's, it's um, you know, a um, kind of a, a extreme form of seclusion and isolation and a way of focusing on, on leading a prayerful life and seeking to uh, move closer to God without any kind of distractions in the world. So, you know, obviously since we've all been uh, isolating and distancing and quarantining and so on. It just seems like an extremely, you know, interesting uh, parallel and a relevant uh, kind of kind of experience to uh, to to highlight. Thank you, thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I will be. I am next, and uh, you know, so uh, you know, so. Um, um, Ah, here we go. Um, th thank you so much, Jamie. It's my turn now. And, uh, you know, since Natalie, uh, you know, got the right time and Jamie beat it by a couple of minutes, I want to try to do it even better. So I'm going to time myself here, 12 minutes, you know, and then when it buzzes, I will give myself just one minute to finish. All right. So, <laughs> um, okay. My name is Tuan Huang, uh, Pepperdine University. I'm a faculty in the Great Books uh, program. Um, and this is my uh, eighth year. Uh, in the great books program. So I'm sharing screen with you here. Oops, sorry, I just lost it. Let's try it again. All right, here we go. So, okay, a story. So um, I, I began, you know, um, I, I literally, uh, you know, submitted my 
uh, my uh, my submission online uh, the night before the the deadline, and you know I was still thinking through, so I came up with solitude is power, right? So I thought of um, you know giving this this presentation in three parts: one about Milton, Paradise Lost; one about Rousseau, discourse on inequality; and then you know the last part about my teaching this class with you know my students last fall. Well, um, last week I thought you know I think this is too much, so I'm to reduce it. I would take out the students. I would just like focus the talk about Milton and Rousseau. And then a couple of days ago, I thought, okay, that is still too much. So I decided, you know, why don't I just focus on Milton? All right. And so, uh, you know, this is where I am. And um, not only that, but also, um, you know, I decided to put a question. The more I think about that, that you know, I, I thought like, okay, solitude is power. Maybe I should uh, put a question. Is it really power, you know, in Paradise Lost? So uh, bear with me here, but basically, you know, um, in the Great Books Program at Pepperdine, we have a four semester uh, sequence, you know, and um, Milton occupies an interesting place in the middle, right? We, we go, you know, through the sequence chronologically with Aristotle in, you know, Great Books 1, and, you know, I have always wanted to teach Julian of Norwich, actually, but, you know, just there, there is, there, there's no room, but now I will consider her having listened to uh, Jamie now, I will seriously consider adding her to Great Books 2, which I will do, be teaching next uh, next year. Um, but anyway, Milton is interesting because I think, you know, that uh, in many ways, <clears throat> excuse me, Paradise Lost occupies um, a place in the early modern era, right, in which um, the, the, the human person, uh, right, that was considered to be part of the community in the classical tradition, right, in the early Christian tradition, in the medieval tradition, uh, the human person was, you know, assumed to be born into a society, into a community, uh, whatever community it might be. Well, the, the early modern era, right, with, with Habs and, and, and Locke and Rousseau, among others, uh, take for granted uh, that there is such a thing as a state of nature, right, and, and assuming that human beings are by nature separate and apart from another. And, uh, you know, and in literature, uh, you know, and we need to remember that Habs and Milton were contemporaries, uh, right? Um, if, if Habs was the best known uh, English, English philosopher at the time, then Milton was, you know, more usually uh, considered the, 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 the most uh, significant literary figure at the same time. And Paradise Lost, I think, is a, a terrific uh, literary, uh, you know, uh, starter, if you will, of this shifting paradigm uh, and savant. Uh, and it is due essentially through the figure of, uh, of, of Satan, right? Uh, state, Satan, this, this, this you know, uh, uh, maybe the first anti-hero we, uh, you know, see uh, at least the, the first major anti-hero we see in, in Western literature, uh, you know, the, 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 the same, uh, uh, you know, figure who um, challenges God. Uh, you know, and, it, it, uh, and and having, you know, taught and read it and taught it for several times by now, um, I often, you know, go back to what uh, the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, uh, you know, he wrote years ago, decades ago, in a breezy short book that perhaps, you know, some of us might have read here, uh, A Short History of Ethics. And, um, you know, and I, 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 I often go back to this, you know, this short history of ethics of, of McIntyre. Uh, you know, he wrote it when he was still an uh, um, uh, analytic philosopher of Marxism, you know, so it was long before he, his, his personal conversion to Christianity and also his, you know, his, his um, uh, really turnaround orientation in philosophy about virtue ethics and so on. But anyway, I thought he pointed out a couple of very interesting things, you know, regarding uh, Paradise Lost. He points out that, you know, that um, uh, uh, Christianity was so dominant for so long, right, in, in the Western world, but at the same time, there were a couple of weaknesses. Uh, and one of them, one of them is that, you know, um, uh, Christianity has to assert the point and the purpose of this life and this world, uh, you know, uh, uh, is that essentially in the end, it is to be found in another world, the afterlife. Uh, well, as long as, you know, people find this life unsatisfactory, then they would be likely be interested in, you know, supporting the Christian claims, right, about, about this world. But uh, uh, McIntyre argues, insofar as they do find adequate projects and purposes, then their interest in Christianity is likely to be weakened. Uh, you know, and so 
um, right, the early era, the early modern era, uh, uh, all kinds of changes going on, including economic growth, right? And this is, you know, again, this is McIntyre, the Marxist type who, who you know, uh, emphasizes economic changes and things like that. But anyway, out of this, um, out of these changes, we see a new model for the human person, the autonomous economic person, uh, you know, and McIntyre cited the false uh, creation of Robinson Crusoe, right? Robin, Robinson Crusoe, a man living on an island and essentially a self-creating uh, person, right? Who became self-sufficient economically and, you know, who, 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 who uh, solitary uh, and so on. Um, you know, and so anyway, my point here is that, you know, for, for McIntyre, he further argues, and I'm quoting from him now, social life becomes essentially an arena for the struggles and conflicts of individual wills. The first ancestor of all these individuals is perhaps Milton Satan. For Satan's motto, non servian it marks not only a personal revolt against God, but a revolt against the concept of an ordained and unchangeable hierarchy, unquote. Right? So, so the point here, right, is, is that, is that um, the, the, the figure of, of, of Satan, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, is more than just an autonomous economic person, right? There is something essentially uh, fundam fundamentally um, altering his, it may start with, you know, this autonomous person, economically speaking, but it, you know, turns into something far more metaphysical and so on. Okay. So anyway, having taught this class for quite a few uh, times by now, you know, and interestingly, I never read this in college. Uh, I was in the great books program, but for some reason, my instructors never assigned it, you know, so having read it um, after, after, you know, before graduate school, just on my own, I, 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 I wasn't sure what to think of it, you know, until I'm teaching it. And I have to tell you, it's such a delight. And I would say that, you know, um, let me focus on the concept of solitude, right? Solitude is power, question mark. I think that to understand um, uh, uh, Satan, we need to understand God the Father uh, in regard to power, in regard to solitude. This is uh, one of William Blake's uh, uh, drawings of, of, you know, of God the Father creating Eve, right, out of uh, Adam's there, Adam is sleeping, of course, and God the Father, right, standing upright and so on. And, um, you know, and it's so interesting to see, uh, and I have a few quotations from Paradise Lost here, right, um, in book eight, for example, Adam asked God, you know, he was born alone, right, and he was, you know, he was, and he noticed that the animals, you know, they have, they, they are with, you know, a lion with a lion, and, you know, a, 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 a tiger with a tiger, and so on, but he, he was the only human being, right, and, you know, I, I wish to call attention to God's response to Adam in this case, all right, what caused thou solitude is not the earth, with various living creatures in the air, replenished? Uh, you know, knows thou not their language and their ways. They also know and reason, you know, not contentedly uh, with these, right? I mean, God is essentially saying, you know, like, how come, you know, you, 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 um, how come you, you, um, 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 I mean, essentially God is refuting, uh, you know, Adam's initial plea to essentially, you know, provide him with a companion, with a human companion, right? Uh, you know, and if you notice, you know, um, in, in this uh, response, out of a longer response, right? We see, uh, right, we see an emphasis on power, thy command, right? Um, uh, bear ro rule, right? Um, you know, um, it's lo it, and also an association, you know, I think with, with, with knowledge as well that, you know, the power and knowledge are, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they go together, right? You know, you know, right? Their language in that way seems in that like, you know, powerful and so on. And of course, Adam said, no, 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 you know, God, you know, I still want to have a companion, right? And, and you know, and God um, kept, um, you know, uh, teasing him, so to speak, okay? And so uh, he asked God for the second time and God responds among the things God said, um, you know, and this one is more about God than about Adam. What thinks thou then of me? And this my state, seem I to thee sufficiently possessed of happiness or not, who am alone from all eternity, for now I know. Second, to me, alike equal, much less. Uh, 
you know, so here, right, we see, we see something even more uh, uh, direct, you know, uh, emphasizing aloneness and apartness, you know, that these, you know, solitude, aloneness, apart of solitariness, uh, you know, they um, characterize, you know, the nature of God. You know, and this is actually not, uh, you know, not surprising, right? For those of us who have read uh, this 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 epic, uh, you know, um, um, uh, scholars, you know, have long pointed out, right, that that Milton has a rather heterodox view of the Trinity, right, in which God the Father is like way above, you know, God the Son. It is not exactly the orthodox view of the Trinity, you know, that that um, uh, uh, Christian churches usually hold. And uh, in some respect, you know, got emphasis on his apartness from, you know, from anything, any other being plays into it. Um, so that is God. And how about Satan? Well, Satan is it's very interesting, um, you know, um, uh, uh, in the first, uh, well, first of all, to begin with, in the first four books, the word alone, right, is used 13 times to mean isolation. And 10 out of those 13 were referred, were referred to Satan himself. Uh, and indeed, right, um, um, you know, uh, for the rest of the, of the book, um, Satan, you know, I mean, after he, 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 he traveled to earth and, you know, uh, he's, you know, spent most of the time alone, essentially, right? I mean, except for his encounter with Eve, in the disguise of the, the serpent, essentially he, 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 he was alone, you know? So, so um, he was really the most solitary, you know, figure in the epic, you know? Yeah, he was, you know, he spent the first couple of uh, books, right? Um, you know, in hell, right? Among his minions, and then he returned uh, to hell triumphantly after successfully tempting Eve and Adam and so on, you know? So he definitely had his moments, but, um, uh, his his solitariness was striking, uh, you know, and 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 you know, and there's more I can say here, but for the sake of time, let me move on to the last figure, who which is Eve, and I do have one minute right now. Um, all right, Eve. Eve is fascinating in my opinion, and indeed, my interest about solitude began, you know, with uh, more recent scholarship, secondary scholarship that I read, you know, about Eve, uh, you know, from. Uh, uh, people like Ava Brand, you know, longtime uh, teacher at St. John's College in, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think in Maryland, I think, uh, you know, and and uh, among many, many uh, quite a few other other uh, scholars. But anyway, um, when you know, in Book Four, uh, we uh, hear about the creation of Eve, right, and basically Eve waking up, you know, after being created. And really her first, right, her first uh, sight with herself, looking at herself, you know, uh, looking at the leg at herself without knowing it quite that it was herself. And she was so drawn to, to the shape, right? Um, and if we move, like, you know, we move the jump ahead here, you know, go way down, right? Uh, well, on the day of, 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 the, of the temptation, right, in the morning, Eve pled to Adam that we should, like, split. I work, you know, we, we should like split physically, okay? Because up to this point, they have been working together uh, during the day, you know? But now she asked, let us divide our labor, right? Um, you, know, uh, you know, if we are close to one another, we, we don't get a lot done, you know? So, well, it is not exactly a very convincing argument, right? And Adam was rather reluctant, okay? And Adam, but Adam acknowledged though, solitude sometimes is bad society. You know, because after all, Adam heard from God alone, right? That I am, I am, you know, like I am, you know, alone. So, so, uh, you know, so he, he has some recognition about that, you know, but, but in, you know, but he, he loves, you know, being around her so much that it was very reluctant, you know, of him to, you know, to, 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 um, to let her go. All right. Okay. I can, I can talk more later during Q and A, but, um, you know, my last slide here, essentially, you know, what, what is this? So, so, you know, my question, the question I have for myself, um, you know, is it like, um, you know, uh, yeah, solitude, separation of partners and autonomy and so on, right? But is it really power? And, you know, we do know that um, Milton has a thing for, for, for separation, right? He advocates divorce, he advocates uh, separation of church and state, you know, he advocates church establishment, you know, he, he, he has a knack for that. And so it's not, maybe it's not a, a big surprise, right, to see him 
bringing that mentality, that that understanding, you know, into into this one. But whether um, it is uh, solitude is power or not, I think I would say that right now my answer is that it depends. Uh, God, yes. Uh, Satan and Eve, uh, I am not quite sure yet. So I'll stop right there. <laughs> I welcome a question or two, otherwise we can just move on to the next uh, speaker. <laughs> well, can you very briefly connect what you said there with, uh, or just talk about solitude and Rousseau? Cause that's one of the reasons I tuned in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rousseau, uh, yes, I can say something about that. Uh, I, I love teaching that, 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 um, that book, by the way. Well, you know, uh, The Savage Man, right? Um, is um, Rousseau views, uh, well, like Hobbes, like Lack and, and uh, a number of other thinkers, Rousseau believes in the, uh, the state of nature, right? But he is so romantic, uh, you know, that, that, um, he, that uh, unlike Lack, unlike Hobbes, right, who view um, individuals to be bad, to be, you know, to be, uh, you know, put, uh, like uh, selfish, right? And, 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 and uh, you know, they would do bad things were not to be a contract or something binding them, right? Well, uh, Rousseau thought that they were good, you know, so they were happy, right? They are idle. Uh, they are, uh, what else? They are happy. They are idle. They are innocent, so to speak. And certainly they are solitary. So I would say that um, even though Milton and, and, and Rousseau, you know, were over a, uh, were about approximately a century apart in, in like the publication of, of um, Paradise Lost and the publication of the treatise, they were like 90 or 87 years or something like that apart, right? Um, um, the view of solitude, um, uh, you know, for, for the both of them carries massive agency. And for Milton, I mean, I'm sorry, for, for, for Rousseau, certainly, right? Society corrupts. Um, the savage man, uh, and so along with you know, along with with along with along with um, along with that corruption, right? Uh, he 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 believes that you know the the loss, the gradual loss of solitude, plays I think a role into that. So that's my short answer to it. Thank you. Well, let's move on to the next speaker then. If uh, it's okay, since you know we have uh, we still have two more papers here. Uh, next is Enrique. Uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself, Enrique. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Enrique Bonus, originally a Spaniard, or a Basque from Spain, or a Spaniard from the Basque country, whatever you want. A bachelor, my master studies and PhD in comparative literature in Germany. Now working in Peru at the University of Pura School of Humanities, and I wanted to speak about a French book. Probably you know it, *The Little Prince* by Antoine de Saint Exupéry. Probably you would like to ask me whether I would dare to include such a small book as *The Little Prince* into the list of core texts or great books side by side with Dante, Tolstoy, or even Seneca. Instead of an answer, let me say that I am using this text as, uh, at university since the 90s, more or less in courses for students at the School of Humanities, Law, Business, Medicine, Nursery, with exciting outcomes. And with a difference to many other texts, for most of the students, it's the second or third reading of this book. Most of them read it already at high school and before. Nevertheless, this second or third reading is very different than the previous one or two. Could this be a sign for a great book? Let me go out from some very simple facts. Probably the book will continue to be alive in high school. Not by chance it is, according to Wikipedia, was is uh, invested by authority, one of the most popular books in the world, having sold an estimated 100, 140 million copies. It has been translated into 31 languages and dialects. Well, there are publications in academic reviews, but also newspapers and blogs presenting highly sophisticated interpretations of the book, typically with a biographical key 
or more exciting in a political frame as critical reflection to France situation in 1943 in World War II. But we can suppose that in primary and high school, there will be uh, present not such kind of readings, but the most traditional one. For younger people, it's a collection of recommendations as a sort of self-help book. So for instance, in an article in the Penguin Books website, seven timeless life lessons from the little prince. For secondary school and for the elder reader, the dominant interpretation goes in the direction of, I quote, the little prince and cultivating our inner child, an ode to the insight and innocence of childhood. So in a blog by Petra Daniel five years ago, or the big lesson I quote again, the big lesson of a little prince, recapture the creativity of childhood. So in the blog in Scientific American, this is the predominant reading. Let's discover the inner child. Let's come to the true reading of the world. Become, let's become again able to see instead of a bourgeois hut, the exciting picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. You remember probably this, uh, uh, this sentence in the first uh, chapter. The new reading with the students discovers a clear structure in the story. The story which deals with solitude, solitudes in the desert, the pilot of the prince of the fox. After an introduction, even this episode with the hat and the elephant, something like a captatio benevolentia for the narrator, the pilot transformed into the narrator tells a story. This story. Is, has been told to him by the little prince. And the story tells the encounter with the fox. In this concentric way, we arrive to the heart, not of darkness, as in Joseph Conrad, but of light. At the end of the relation between the fox and the prince, the fox transmits the key message to the prince, a message introduced by the most famous, the most quote sentence of the book. And now I quote, here is my secret, a very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the A, to the I, end of the quote. And the message is transmitted on the same waves as the story, but now from the inner to the outer circle, from the fox to the prince, from the prince to the pilot narrator, from the narrator to the reader. But it is the fox, not the prince's secret. It's the fox, not the prince's wisdom. The prince understands it and changes life. He, at the end, returns to this planet. But all, the pilot, too, understands the message and change life. He takes care about the prince's sorrows. Both have been wrong. The prince in leaving the planet, the pilot in rejecting the prince's desire of a dialogue. Also the prince was rejecting a dialogue with this strange flower and was looking for a different dialogue, looking for friends, not accepting the original uh, dialogue. The pilot was not looking not for dialogue, was looking for solving the vital problem of being unable to escape from the desert in a situation in which water was ending. He wanted to be alone with his problem. The prince wanted not to be alone, but accompanied without being responsible. Here in both characters, there is, so to say, a solitude and a metanoia. Those are parallel stories. Both have been able to understand the change of perspective proposed by the fox precisely in a situation of crisis. More exactly, at the deepest point of a crisis. In fact, the prince, after traveling through different planets in which he uh, met strange personalities, 
arrives at the earth and discovered, discovers that the exotic flower in his planet, whose special appeal seemed to be exactly its uniqueness, is a rose. And I quote, his flower had told him that she was the only one of her kind in all the universe. And here were 5,000 of them all alike in one single garden. And we may add, in a single garden, in the desert. So the flower is not only a common flower, not unique, but also it lies. And the prince, I quote, lay down in the grass and cried. Precisely in this moment, at the bottom of the Christ, of having lost the, the only element which was making this relation interesting, this was the uniqueness, precisely in that moment the fox appears. It was needed to come to the, to the bottom of the crisis for receiving the message. In the case of the pilot, also he arrived at a point of extreme vital danger. I quote, I was very much worried, he is telling the own story, for it was becoming clear to me that the breakdown of my plane was extremely serious and I had so little drinking water left that I had to fear for the worst, end of the quote. And just in that moment, the prince comes with a question that seems absurd, absurd and insists, like kids do, and brings the pilot to despair, like kids sometimes do. Oh no, I cried. No, 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 I don't believe anything. I answered you with the first thing that came into my head. Don't you see I'm very busy with matters of consequence? And here the prince explodes. The little prince, the narrator tell, was now with, white with rage. It is in that moment, at the bottom of the crisis, that the pilot understands the shift he has to take over. It is at the bottom of the crisis when each of them is able to see his real situation, to recognize their own reality, to change who came out from the solitude, the desirable solitude in the case of the pilot, the solitude of looking for friendships without having understood what friendship, friendship really is. The bottom of the crisis is, is the precondition of metanoia. Maybe good to remember in a time of pandemics. In a certain sense, the pilot's metanoia is more profound than the prince's one pressed by a vital need in an extremely challenging situation, he's able to overcome the own limitations and to accept the priority of dialogue, of taking care of absurd seeming sorrows of the other. Nevertheless, in the reception, the prince is the protagonist. The pilot is considered a representative of this adult's world that only can be changed when rediscovering the child in themselves. But the key secret is not the child's one. The child, like the pilot, was wrong, but the fox one. But also, it is not the protagonist. Why this misreading? Probably due to the convergence of three factors the canon, the tradition, and the beginning of the book. Only very brief. It is classified as children's literature. The children is mentioned. So the prince is the protagonist, a cultural tradition. In some comments to the little prince, Picasso is called saying, all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. There is a certain tradition of seeing the child's world as a creative, not contaminated one. And then when growing up, we are losing creativity. Pierre Bourdieu once said in a debate that l'école détruit, the spontaneous prophetic reading and substitutes it by a traditional one. This and many similar points of view are reinforced by the introduction that consequently lead us to the opposition between the two perspectives. 
It is therefore understandable that we look at the ch child as guideline for overcoming crisis and changing minds and not to the folks, which is the origin of the recognition of discovering the other and initiating a true dialogue as a way of coming out from the self-centered solitude exercised by the way, by almost all the inhabitants of the planets. And to the pilot, the, who at the end is able paradoxically, paradoxically, sorry, to find water and to leave the desert because he has abandoned bones, issues as first priorities for taking care about a prince, a sheep, and a flower in an unknown planet. So the re-reading of the little prince is also a fascinating reflection of the role of prejudices in reading. This is the advantage of reading with students a book that has been read before. You can confront them with their previous readings. And in that way, you and they are involved in the question of reading prejudices, hermeneutics, Gardner's truths and methods, and so on. Crisis is point of departure. This change is a uh, challenge for shifting the paradigm. If you read this book in a series, you can recognize that it is after the end of a long period of Western literature is written, after the end of the long period of Western literature, in which narratives were centered in the question of identity. But if you look to Pirandello, Olamuno, or also Thomas Mann's, Tony Kruger, or Joseph Boltz, Radetzky Marsh, and so many others, you may also become aware of the deep found the secret crisis of this identity centrism. And you can see this book as a proposal how to come out from the solitude. One of the many proposals presented during and after World War II. So again, if, if I may, in the crisis we're facing now, facing now, I would like to wish you that you read again this great small book and you discover the fox you have inside or even the pilot. Thank you very much. Thank you, wow. Uh, Enrique, I want to say that actually, uh, this is my second time at ACTC uh, hear, hearing, li listening to a paper about a little prince. Um, I think it was like maybe like five years ago in Atlanta, you know, that I heard actually from another European, um, you know, uh, who gave a paper on it. So thank you for this very interesting presentation. Any question for Enrique? Welcome, thank you very much for the occasion. I also teach the little prince and I I agree with you that it's it's very useful to have um, them rereading a text that they get so much more out of it and it it also offers such a, a welcome space in the the rhythm of the class uh, that if, if folks haven't tried it out yet there's many many things that are great about this text that connect in in many ways Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. I, I uh -huh. have a, a, a quick question, if it's all right. Henrique, um, I wondered if one of the things that might lead to us uh, uh, misinterpreting where the wisdom comes from is our association, a sort of traditional association of the fox with uh, craftiness, right? Uh, Wiley is a fox and that sort of uh, uh, double, you know, uh, uh, it is the book by, by casting this as the fox trying to um, soften our understanding of what the what craftiness or, or wit or trying to make it something um, tame and wise I don't know tame tame's not quite quite the right word but try to to soften or familiarize our understanding of of uh, uh, what we traditionally associate with the fox the fox is normally not the good guy you know uh, I not not always the bad guy but nor, so anyway I wonder uh, if you could speak a bit to that yeah Um, well, this is this is true. Uh, this is true, yes. But uh, in the in the introduction is given the advice not to read according to the tradition, not to see the hut, but uh, the 
the, the, the other perspective. So there is, in a certain sense, a guiding uh, towards the uh, understanding that here um, the traditional roles are uh, changing, yes. But um, this, this guiding uh, is, um, is ambiguous. It's ambiguous in the sense that uh, it is correcting some traditions, but is guiding also the view to, um, to the protagonism of the child, of the prince, yes? So uh, I think we are prevented to, to look at the fox with the traditional view but we are not prevented to look to the prince with the traditional view, yes. So I'm not sure whether I was able to explain what I'm trying to say, because this is to me a, a little bit of a mysterious thing, this introduction is um, a little bit mysterious. I'm not, not sure what, what the descent, at the end is the message of this introduction is. Um, because I, I think the, 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 the book is unfair to the pilot. Eh? <laughs> the pilot is, a, a, is an excellent guy. You know? At the end, he, he makes, a, makes a transformation which is, which is very, very tough. You know? So I think we have to, 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 to make justice <laughs> to, the, to the pilot. <laughs> So that's also part of a tradition of children's books, though, right? Is the grown up doesn't quite understand, but has to be shown one way or another. And here, you know, that's true, but also has turned on its head a bit, too. That's maybe another traditional or thing that we have to reread a bit. Interesting. No, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating. Um, reading because it, it puts many different relations to common reading, so to say, to tradition, to prejudices and, and so on. But also you are able to take this distance from your previous readings. This is the astonishing to me when reading it with the students that they say, oh, I, I read this book, I read this book. and. You have to make the effort that they read it, read it again. Yes, it's like going to the museum. I was there when I was a kid. I have not to go back. Yes, so please read it again. Yes, and and then this um, this astonishing phenomenon of of uh, of uh, a new reading, a new development, new yeah. discoveries uh, is oh. being, uh, and this is. To me, very interesting. Thank because you. Some great books, they read it them um, for the first time you know, at the university. Thanks. Thank you, Enrique. Great. Um, you know, I'm sure we will we'll likely come back to, to it again, but let's, let's uh, fi you know, finish the, the presentation with um, uh, Elizabeth Jane. Please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Jane McGuire. I'm uh, an assistant professor in the Augustine and Culture Seminar Program at Villanova University outside of Philadelphia. Um, so that's our Great Books first year course in Ancients and Moderns. Um, so I've been there for about six years. And um, my, my area of expertise is in spirituality and how it intersects with music um, in particular. But uh, this paper is on one of my favorite uh, spiritual authors, and that's Thomas Merton, and how uh, he's someone who I normally teach. But when I taught him, um, when I taught him last year, uh, things really, uh, really opened up in some interesting ways. So this paper is a bit more pedagogical um, in nature. Um, I also want to say thanks to all the previous presenters because uh, I think I'm redesigning my whole course on the, I'm adding Julian of Norwich. Like I'm just, I'm putting everyone in. I'm doing Aristotle now. I'm like, oh, this is a really good plan to think about, oh, what, what would it be like to, to think about a course um, designer on the question of solitude 
uh, doing Genesis, a little bit of Milton. So I, I really like ACTC for that. And if you give me just a second, I'm so sorry, right when my presentation begins, my laptop told me that it's gonna die. So <laughs> let me just do the plugin really quick. And there we go. Okay. Now I should be good. <laughs> All right. Um, Uh, when my students at Villanova were sent home on Friday, March 13th of last year to finish out the semester online due to the COVID-19 pandemic, they left a vibrant academic and social community to find themselves in lockdown with, for good or for bad, their families. My students were suddenly unable to meet in person with anyone other than their parents, their siblings, or other relatives that they happened to live with. Uh, some of them reported they weren't even allowed to leave their homes, that their parents were being very strict about, um, about staying inside, at least initially in those first few weeks. Uh, this social isolation made my students particularly responsive to reading some of Thomas Merton's famed spiritual autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, as well as a few of his most characteristic and memorable essays, including Rain and the Rhinoceros, uh, learning to Live, The Inner Experience, and Fire Watch, July 4th, 1952. Merton lived from 1915 to 1968, and he spent the better part of his adult life in a cloistered monastery in rural Kentucky. He was a prolific writer, concerned with many things, uh, cultural, but primarily spirituality and uh, issues surrounding peace and justice. So in a typical academic year, I would teach these writings at the end of the spring semester to my university freshmen in an effort to help them see that a part of their identity, uh, even a crucial part of their humanity, is wrapped up in their interiority. We would normally discuss their need to have their cell phones with them at all times, their texting habits rather than talking to people in person, people sitting right next to them, and their drive to stay as busy as possible. Um, and all these things in sort of subconscious ways of distracting themselves from their deeper thoughts and feelings. We would typically delve deeper into what it means to get a liberal arts education rather than simply undergoing vocational training toward a secure high paying job. And I would usually assign them the task of spending say like a half an hour tech free um, meditating in stillness or maybe just going for a relaxing walk and just to report back, what did that feel like? Was it different than their normal use of time? If so, how so? Did it feel like a waste since they didn't accomplish anything or did they feel refreshed? Uh, were they able to give appropriate consideration to something they had been meaning to think about but kept stifling under the weight of all their daily activity? With a few exceptions, most of my freshmen typically see the benefits of being alone and silent for those 30 minutes. But given their immersion in campus life, this was pretty much destined to be a one-time occurrence. They'd say, yep, that, that was interesting. I should do that more. And then, you know, never again. Uh, you, could, you could be sure of that. But in the spring of 2020, my students were suddenly able, willingly or not, to make the practice of silent reflection more of a habit. Uh, and this made them keenly receptive to Thomas Merton's proposal to engage intentionally in the practice of solitude. Merton invites his readers to embrace the place they find themselves in, for better and for worse, as a space to receive divine grace. We become more attentive to and accepting of our surroundings through the practice of silence in solitude a situation that normally is kind of uniquely monastic, that escape from the world, um, now became the situation that most of us found ourselves in during uh, the initial shutdown. The first piece of Merton, uh, Merton's that I use with my students is an excerpt from his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain. And this excerpt that I choose to study centers around the moments leading up to his conversion from an agnostic to a Catholic. Since Villanova is a Catholic Augustinian institution, um, all freshmen in the fall semester read the first eight books of Augustine's Confessions, the more autobiographical portion. So this makes Merton's conversion experience a wonderful way to tie in the spring's modern content with their first semester on campus. Just like Augustine, Merton tried out a number of intellectual positions regarding faith before settling on Christianity. 
both men were highly intelligent, cultured, and social. Merton was also deeply influenced by his close friends and teachers, both in his debauched years and in the years leading up to his conversion. And in addition, Merton models the process of his conversion on Augustine's, particularly in his focus on desire and the will. As Merton gets closer to the moment of his conversion, he writes of his view of the Catholic faith, quote, I not only accepted this intellectually, but now I began to, de to desire it. And not only did I begin to, de to desire it, but I began to do so efficaciously. I began to want to take the necessary means to achieve this peace. So um, we read a passage very similar to this in the Confessions where Augustine says, okay, I, I assent intellectually to this, but now there needs to be a movement of the will. I need to actually want to do this. It, it's not enough for your reason to say, yes, I agree. Your will also has to be a part of that, um, that internal decision. And once we do simply desire it, you know, once you're willing it, you're doing it. Um, and Merton says the, the result is an inner peace. Both Augustine and Merton also recognize the significance of grace in helping the human soul move past its primal desires. Uh, I will often have my students compare Hobbes and Nietzsche's understanding of desire with Augustine and Merton's. Merton is particularly helpful here because he is in and of the modern world, the world we live in. Um, and he was formed by Hobbes and Nietzsche just as much as he was formed by Augustine. So there's not as much of a, a gap there between understanding Augustine's you know, milieu and thought process versus understanding Merton's and connecting it to our own. Uh, we typically finish our discussion of the Seven Story Mountain with a conversation about feeling called to go somewhere or to do something or to be with somebody and wondering what is this ineffable pull that brings us to a certain college or moves us toward a particular major or throws us into contact with a special person? And how do we know when it feels right? Because it's only right, it only feels right if it lasts for a long time. Um, otherwise, you know, something that feels right at the beginning, we, we can be wrong about. So how do we know when things feel right if they actually are right? Both Augustine and Merton respond, we know because we are at peace. Uh, moving on after the autobiographical reading, we move to some of Merton's essays. My personal favorite is Firewatch, July 4th, 1952 from his book, The Sign of Jonas. In this essay, Merton offers a kind of stream of consciousness narrative about an evening when he has been assigned to firewatch duty at his monastery named Gethsemane. So he walks through the monastery, descending as Christ descended into hell, into the furnace room in the basement. And then he comes back up, winds his way through the kitchen, the refectory, the dormitory halls, the retreatants area, now empty, the church. And then he ascends to the final place um, of the church tower, the highest point in the monastic complex. And as he's walking, he describes being both radically present in that moment of doing the fire watch while also being profoundly connected to his past and that web of memories that, um, uh, of who he was that brought him to this present moment. So for my students in quarantine, when I now ask them to answer the prompt, what is your Gethsemane? it became painfully clear that it was this moment in their parents' houses um, without their friends, uh, without their, their community. Finding ourselves isolated involuntarily was an opportunity to experience true silence and the chance to sit with ourselves. Merton might say that this is a, a quote, pretext devised by God to isolate you and to search your soul with lamps and questions in the heart of darkness. During the pandemic, and in particular during that initial shutdown and isolation, we all lost pretty much all the things we were accustomed to doing and being. And Merton writes of being in the monastery, quote, the things I thought were so important because of the effort I put into them have turned out to be of small value. 
And the things I never thought about, the things I was never able either to measure or to expect were the things that mattered. In Firewatch, Merton explores the significance of the place we find ourselves in, the sensory stimuli each place offers us, and the webs of personal memory we create with these people and places as we live out our lives there. So after reading this piece, I asked my students to do a walking tour of their own homes, which normally I can't do, normally they're in their dorms, but here it's saying, you know what, walk through the house that a lot of you probably grew up in. Walk through this house with fresh eyes. Re-see what you grew up seeing. Smell what your home smells like. Hear what it sounds like. Describe things that have a particularly memorable feel when you touch them. What memories do these sensory stimuli bring up? How has this place made you who you are? Last spring, many students were less than thrilled at their loss of independence. They were annoyed at needing to be back home. But Merton invites us to experience the familiar with a greater attunement to their particularity. And he suggests that we live in the present moment by accepting where we find ourselves in all its beauty and its ugliness. A second Merton essay that I use is entitled The Inner Experience. This conveys the core ideas behind the spiritual practice of meditation, most significantly the uncovering of the inner self. Merton tells us that when we say I, we are most likely parroting the quote, opinions, tastes, deeds, desires, hopes, and fears about someone who is not really present. Rather, it is the anonymous authority of the collectivity speaking through your mask, through your face. Merton teases out this distinction between a secular and a sacred worldview and proclaims that like Augustine, the way to resolve our internal conflict between sacred and secular is to liberate ourselves from constant diversions as Pascal uh, uh, also prescribed, seeing God as our only master. A third piece I use is Rain in the Rhinoceros. This does a great job at exploring the gratuity of the natural world. Merton makes the statement that, quote, rain is a festival. He says, it can't be turned into a utility like water and electricity. Instead, rain is a free gift. We can take it, we can leave it, but it's there for us to enjoy and appreciate it. One example that always gets me is when he points out that we now dedicate trees to people. So we buy and plant trees and put signs in front of them with people's names on them to remember them. It's a nice sentiment, but Merton points out our need to commodify things so much that we even commodify nature. And he says, can't trees just be trees? Does everything have to be monetized, right? Um, he furthers his discussion of gratuity and grace with a critique of the modern notion of having fun, especially it's, as it is connected to materialism. So this is really striking at the heart of the, uh, the 18 year old college student. Um, I often use the example of New Year's Eve, which I find to be the most overrated holiday of the year. I am free to argue about that in the Q&A portion if you want. Uh, there's a lot of hype surrounding the beginning of the new year, but typically parties seem kind of contrived. And I don't know about you, but at my age, few people actually wanna stay up until midnight uh, to bang on a pot and a pan, to have a drink that you're gonna pay the price for the next morning. Um, having fun isn't all it's cracked up to be. And Merton points to the added silliness and even spiritual danger of material items that are marketed to us to increase our fun, whether these are plastic toys, electric gadgets, exotic vacations. And he says, rather than seeking ways to have fun as college students and really many of us often do, could we instead consider the enjoyment we get from living our lives with the people who surround us right now? Uh, at the start of the pandemic last spring, a lot of students were getting to spend more time with their parents and their siblings. And I heard stories about them playing one-on-one -on -one basketball with their younger brothers, going for walks, playing card games with their parents. And these increased familial bonds um, and gave them time to kind of step out of the rat race. And it was fun and free. Right? Um, and they were sleeping and eating well. They were probably healthier than they had been in, in six months. All right, um, let's just check here. Okay, two minutes, I think. I don't know if you have the same, uh, Tuan, but I'll, I'll try and wrap things up. So um, just to sort of talk about some of the assignments that I do. 
to complement the readings on Merton, I assign intellectual journals over the, the few days that we discuss him. And last spring, I turned it into what I, I called a hermitage journal to underscore the similarity of my students' removal from the world with Merton's chosen vocation. In these journals, I had students reflect on things like the gratuity of nature. Um, I would love to show you, if there's time in the Q&A, a few examples. Uh, Merton would take uh, what he called Zen photographs, and they were black and white pictures of the natural world. They were often not particularly beautiful things in nature, um, but it was this acceptance of what he saw. Um, and so I had my students step outside their homes and take a black and white photograph and share it in a, in a wiki. And uh, it, what they found was really quite, quite beautiful. Um, I had them do the stay off your phone exercise, but this time with some more explicit instructions um, or clear their mind. Um, and responses shifted from the more typical, oh, that was nice, but I'm glad to get back to my friends. Um, to far more substantive observations about how quickly their brain wanted to dodge the stillness. Um, I just thought that was so interesting because during the normal academic year, if you put your phone down, you know you're going back into real life. So you can kind of excuse your distraction. But in quarantine, they knew they had nothing else to do. And so that it bothered them that they couldn't clear their mind. They, they couldn't figure out why. Um, so it's actually really helpful for them to see, no, this isn't just a problem of normal life. This is a human problem that we have trouble stilling our mind um, and allowing it to, to be interior. Um, let's see here. So um, I guess I'll just wrap up by saying with less to distract them and pull them back into the world, Students were more responsive than ever to these types of readings and prompts. Um, Merton's essays invite undergraduates experiencing personal loss, fear, isolation, um, to practice attentive focus on the current moment, allowing judgments of this is good or this is bad to be set aside and instead permitting the world to simply exist. And I found that when students documented their practice of silence, they grew closer to understanding their inner selves and felt more integrated both personally and academically. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Chain. Uh, you know, it's uh, open now, but you maybe like the first one or two questions towards um, Elizabeth's paper, and then, you know, we still have at least uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, please um, go ahead, Jamie. Oh, okay. Um... Thank you so much. Uh, that that was uh, wonderful. Um, I just had a quick question on the uh, issue of silence uh, for Thomas Merton um, and the way that that, that Merton thinks about silence. Um, so, you know, how does Merton, or for that matter, how does anyone adjudicate between uh, meaningful silence and just you know vacuous silence, just silence for the sake of it? Because you know we can all be silent. That doesn't necessarily mean we're having you know, productive or constructive or spiritual or meaningful thoughts. So how, how, do, you, how do you make that distinction between uh, meaningful and, and, and vacuous uh, silence? And um, I agree with you on New Year's Eve, by the way. I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a really interesting question. So um, in, Merton was very interested in merging the Christian and um, Eastern meditation traditions. So he studied both. Um, and, uh, and learned from uh, the, the techniques and practices of uh, the, the Desert Fathers as well as um, Buddhist, um, Buddhist monks. Uh, so looking at their kind of more established practices, um, there, there are techniques of, um, of quieting the mind and uh, I think at least in the beginning, you, you certainly can't expect to have no thoughts, um, but looking past the thoughts, again, sort of allowing those thoughts to exist, but um, kind of like, uh, you know, I've got small children. So uh, when I'm trying to talk to my husband and you've got, you know, people kind of jumping in between us, you can't just pretend that's not there or you can't make it go away. Um, but you have to you have to sort of mentally acknowledge that is there 
but my focus is here. It's on my husband as we're having a conversation, right? And eventually this starts to go away <laughs> in your mind and becomes just the focus on your interiority. Um, I think the result of what you find, so because it's not, um, it, it's not like uh, Ignatian prayer, which is very imaginative. You're not, you know, sort of putting yourself in a scene. What, what if I were a maid in the stable where Jesus was born? And you're not sort of allowing your thoughts to, to wander in this way. Um, this type of meditation is very much a quietness, a stillness. Um, and it's not really a, a dialogue. That, that is a type of prayer, but it's not the type that Merton was particularly aiming for. Does that help answer a little bit? Mm -hmm. Jamie, what was it you said you agreed with Elizabeth on there at the end of your query? Oh, I was I was just joking. I was saying I agreed with what she said about New Year's Eve. Oh, I do too. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> yeah, that, that was all. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Elizabeth, I forgive me if you said this and I missed it, but what class did you do this in or which classes? I, I teach a great books course at Villanova that all freshmen take. It's called the Augustine and Culture Seminar. And we split it up between ancients in the fall and moderns in the spring. So I do this at the end of moderns. At the end of moderns, okay. And and you only did the, the half an hour kind of stay off your phone thing of once? Um, yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> uh, I've done more and sometimes I get very angry responses. You know, my mom thought that I was dead and I'm just, you know. I, <laughs> Well, I would just uh, support you, and if you decide to keep this up even after the pandemic, I've I've assigned 24 hours, and I warned them from the beginning of the semester that they can plan it, and they need to let everybody know, you know, not to worry. And then I got even bolder and went to two 24-hour days that they could do consecutive or to split it up. Um, yeah, there's, there's some resistance, but I would say it's like a bell-shaped curve. There's some really resistant people. There's some really curious and interested in doing it people and most fall somewhere in the middle. But they all get benefit from it. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a comment and a question, uh, actually two comments. Well, first of all, you know, to all the panelists and everyone um, you know attending who have given a paper at this conference, you know I am the um, uh, uh, general ed uh, proceedings editor, and I would you know welcome your submission of your papers, uh, you know in in uh, you know in the next like six weeks or so. Um, um, Elizabeth Jane actually uh, served as uh, one of the editors from last uh, from the, the current issue, and Greg Cam, you know, has edited has been the main editor of of another issue before, you know, and, and we know that, you know, um, there are many terrific papers, you know, and so please uh, um, um, consider that. Uh, this, the, my other comment has to do with uh, Elizabeth Jane's paper, and then my question is for all the panelists. Um, I, I, um, I, I went to high school in the U.S., and I have to tell you, I was slightly, uh, delight, delightfully surprised, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, when you were talking about um, the seven story mountain, you know, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't appear in the abstract. So I didn't expect it totally at all. And so, you know, I love that book, reading it, you know, as a high school student, uh, you know, uh, and, and I'm, 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 I'm impressed, actually. I mean, it's a very thick book, um, uh, right? Uh, but but uh, to begin with, like the quantity is a huge book, like 500 pages of small print or something like that. And then, you know, in a way, looking back, you know, the world of the pre-Vatican Catholicism, right, in France and in the U.S., I mean, honestly, in my opinion, it may be easier to get students, you know, to understand medieval, you know, Christianity, like, you know, by reading, you know, by reading, right, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, Juliet uh, of, of, of Norwich, you know, than, 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 than Thomas Merton. So I, I'm just curious, you know, uh, what is the challenge in teaching that book, right, you know, were there uh, you know, were students surprised? I mean, I imagine you have to be selective anyway because of the length of the book, uh, right? But but I'm just curious, you know, uh, how to convey that, right? I mean, I, 
the, the Augustinian the, the strategy of, of, of um, comparing it to confession sounds great to me, and it makes total sense. But I'm just curious, you know, beyond that. And then my other question, you know, for everybody uh, here is, um, you know, regional uh, pandemic um, right life. Um, it seems to me that um, you know, even though nobody quite mentioned that in the presentation, somehow it emerged in my mind that you know ritualization seems to be a pretty important part, right? To make life normal as possible during the pandemic. And I'm just curious, you know, from the text that we have been presenting, you know, at this panel, right? Is there anything related to ritual, ritualization, you know, that perhaps, you know, we can share some insight, you know, specifically to our students and, you know, to life overall during the pandemic. So if you don't mind, uh, Elizabeth, you're first. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I excerpt for my undergraduates, I'll excerpt the seven story mountain. I only use about 70 pages uh, of it um, in, in the central portion. Um, when I do it in a graduate course on uh, spiritual autobiography, I, then oh. we read the whole thing. But um, that's why I choose the essays that I did, because I feel like they reveal big parts of this thought. The other thing is that the Seven Story Mountain is so early in Thomas Burton's yeah. Christian life yeah. that a lot actually happens after that. So to only focus on the Seven Story Mountain would be doing him a disservice in some ways. Um, so yeah, I, I do not do the whole thing because I think that the Seven Story Mountain is probably the densest, much denser than the other essays that we read. Do I? I have a question for you. Um, the last line of Paradise Lost has the word solitary in it. Oh, yeah. They, oh, yeah. they hand in hand with wandering steps and slow through Eden took their solitary way. Yeah. It seems like it's a solitude with two people in it. And I wanted to ask you, um, most, uh, all of you who spoke on this panel spoke about solitude as if it were the same thing as, um, as, as if it were singular always. And I wanted to ask you about that line and how you, th what you thought Milton might mean by that. Oh, that's a that's a good question and a tough one. Um, you know, I um, I, I think there are um, there is more than one line of thinking. You know, one is that um, you know I, I think I think like the early feminist uh, interpretation, you know, Sandra Guber, uh, you know, uh, Guber, and and so on. I think they they tend to look at that. You know, is an argument, right, that that um, 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 Eve, um, um, you know, uh, repented, uh, you know, out of hierarchical, out of patriarchal, you know, uh, force and violence and so on, right? Um, uh, and and even though she reconciled with Adam and so on, um, you know, uh, she expressed the need for him. Right and so on. Um, it was not exactly, you know, um, a, a unity thing. So, so in a way, you know, they were still apart in some respects. You know, so that's like one one interpretation that I've read. You know, another one is to argue that you know more kind of like um, uh, they they are married, they are together, they are married. Yeah, so I mean, they are here together, right? Uh, living together. And it was very sad and tragic in many respects. Uh, but essentially, you know, it's meant that they are on their own, so to speak. Uh, you know, we, I mean, obviously with the hope, right, of the future here that, you know, one day, right, um, um, Eve, you know, a descendant of Eve will bear Mary, right, who will in turn bear the savior, the son, you know, and so on. Um, so those are two, and I think they are more, you know, interpretations. Uh, but. Um, it is a very tough one, in my opinion, to interpret, uh, um, uh, you know, par partially because uh, there is a big history, I, I guess, you know, behind um, English usage of the terms uh, solitary, solitariness, and, and a few other things. Uh, back there. So that's probably my short answer to it, but it is um, rather ambiguous, uh, you know, than clear.
if, if yeah, if I may, um, so two things. Uh, one, uh, your question about ritual and where that might come in. Um, so I do recommend, uh, uh, Elizabeth, you're talking about redesigning your courses or designing a course around solitude. Uh, I, I do, I, I think it'd be awesome. I would recruit as many students as possible, but I would, I would really recommend an intention to some of the, the more uh, positive ideas of solitude or of, or of suffering that uh, you and Jamie presented. Arendt sees um, pain as the most private thing, as the thing that uh, makes us withdraw from one another. Um, that that uh, can't by its very nature be public or be shared. So that, that it's an interesting contrast. But to, to go back to Tuan's question about uh, ritual, um, it, for rent, part of the frustrating thing about um, the solitude of the divine or of the animal nature that leaves out the communal, the the, the people being together, is that there's no way to to, to uh, create the table that unites us. There's no way to create that thing that, that we both sit across from and we both, um, and that's, that's essential to our understanding of what work is, that, 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 that durable, the thing that creates, that manufactures the durable world that persists, not eternally, but beyond us, that continues, that, that, that unites us, that we can both sit across from one another. And I think that uh, a ritual can be that too, can, can allow us to have a place, it's not, um, the self-disclosing action that is specially human, um, it, it, but it is uh, creating a world that we can then relate to one another within the table that goes be between us. So I, I think that that's uh, an important role of ritual that I think is is really, in some ways, though it's a big claim, lacking in, in Plato and Aristotle. The, the, everything is so uh, individual there, which it, it of course has a lot of uh, uh, connotation or uh, 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 interesting caveats, but it's individual in the ancient world, uh, virtue, um, arete, like the, the, your personal longings and going for things. Whereas now I think we do understand that we can create something that will unite us, that can tell a story around the situation we're all in. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask you on uh, both God the Father uh, and uh, Satan, Lucifer, are alone when in relationship to Adam and Eve, right? Um, I, I wonder if there's some some doubling there. We, it's, it's not until uh, Lucifer is, is in relation to Adam and Eve on Earth that he is then the solitary power. You know, uh, I wonder if, if when you're, we put the question mark after, you know, solitary power, like, is this a, a thing? Um, there's, a, there's an interesting doubling there, right? Where God is, is you know, uh, solitary best when he's in relation to, to man. And then Satan or, or the devil or Lucifer, you know, <laughs> uh, he's very communal when he's in his own right. But then when he comes to be in relationship to man, he's been the, the, that solitary thing that is always contrasting with Adam and Eve together. I just, I, I, when you were doing your talk, I found that doubling interesting. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I, uh, I should clarify. I, I think that um, Satan's, you know, um, uh, solitude is in, in, in the sense of power. Um, it, it was circumstantial, you know, he, he got to conquer, so to speak, the earth. Um, you know, in order to challenge God, right? That was his plan, you know, that was how he manifests power and so on. Um, well, it, it is very interesting because, because, you know, after the war in heaven, uh, right, uh, Satan was condemned to, to uh, well, he was sent to, to hell. Um, he still believed that he and God were equal except for, in, for physical strength. You know, that was different. Uh, right, but in his mind, you know, I can't remember the lie right now, but like, you know, reasoning in terms of reasoning, he thinks that he's still, you know, as good as God, yeah, you know, um, in that respect, right? So, so, so plotting and planning becomes, so to speak, his, 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 his instrument, uh, you know, and, and I think by circumstances, he got to be, you know, uh, alone. Um, so, so, you know, so it's so by, by activity as well, right? Like by 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 circumstance, but that reminds me of that. Uh, you know, there's the 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 Christian activity that draws uh, Julian of Norwich and and Merton to be alone, 
um, which has its own proper context and it has its own questions. And then there's the, the power-based maybe uh, draw towards solitude, towards, uh, towards uh, power, towards, you know, there, there, there's that sort of other side of it that you're drawn to a situation where you are alone, where maybe you're contemplative, you're, you're but, but it's not for the sake of um, service or delight, but for the sake of power. There's interesting doubling there too. Yeah, yeah. so exactly, instrumentality may be a good way of thinking about that, you know? And I think uh, in case of Eek, now that you asked about it, but, uh, you know, um, I think that she's really desiring, uh, you know, desiring autonomy for sure, right? But possibly power as well, uh, you know? She was pretty aware of, of um, you know, that, that, yeah, did not, endow her with the rational capacity that, you know, the way that, that uh, Adam, you know, possessed in the, like from the beginning, uh, you know, Adam was created and he kind of like, he, he knew everything uh, right away, you know, um, Eve was not like that uh, at all. So I, I, I think it's possible to argue that, you know, she desires some form of power, except that it was right, frustrated uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And so, uh, yeah. Forgive the interruption and I know we have to go soon, but I'm just curious, for those that are in this session, because they personally value solitude or silence, I'm, I'm wondering if you have engaged in any serious solitude experience beyond turning off your phone for a day. Oh. And if you had, would you share that with your students? Silent retreat. <laughs> Well, I have done that, that one. That's a long time, so I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> I have done a silence retreat, but I haven't felt courageous enough to share it with my students because oh. I don't, I try very much to not make my teaching about me. <laughs> you know, and, and yet I know that there's also something about each of us that draws us to the kinds of texts and teaching that we do. And oh. there, yeah, so I guess, um, I just w look, was looking for guidance from others about the balance you strike about that in general, I suppose, what your students pick up from you around the edges versus what you say specifically and in the context of this panel around solitude practices. Mm. Mm. Any, any thoughts? <laughs> Well, so I can't, I don't do this anymore. Um, and I'm looking for a new clip. Um, there's a comedian who has been um, publicly disgraced from his behavior, Louis CK. Um, but he had just a really great five minute clip of an interview with him and uh, Conan O'Brien. And they're talking about the ways that we distract ourselves that prevent us from having real feelings um, and how that's why 100% of drivers are texting while driving because we don't want to feel anything. Mm -hmm. And with comedy, um, I think that is a way where it's not me, 40 year old lady saying, you should spend a weekend in a silent retreat. I do it. Like, I don't think that's a compelling reason for anybody to do anything. Um, even though I do think it's great and I go on silent retreats, like I, I, I just don't, uh, the 30 minute cell phone thing is about as much as they want to take from me. But a comedian, a, a relevant, at least he was relevant, right? Um, that, that worked really well at uh, triggering discussion. So yeah, it, it's hard because they don't have many points, many cultural touchstones that we all share anymore. Um, so it's hard to find those moments. Well, um, I'm, an interdisciplinarian, but my background, my PhD is in psychology, and I'll just offer this as, I don't know if it would count as a touchstone, but um, sensory deprivation tanks. And they used to be difficult to get access to, mm. but now there's these, um, these places around that offer you floating pods where you go into this dark uh, thing of Epsom salts that supports you and you close the thing and there's no sound and there's no light and you just spend time in there. But they even have put it so that you can have sound or you can have woo woo music or woo woo lights because I think people are, that you have to ease your way into some of that sometimes. But that's one of the forms of 
you know, you're only in there for an hour or three, depending on what kind of session you book. But that's one form of solitude I do. I've done much more dramatic things than that, but I still, I just never ever share them with them. And I agree with you. It's not about, oh, I'm a 40 year old lady and this is good, you should do it. But it's also the case that, um, yeah, I've already said enough and we're running late. I have one yeah. last comment. Um, I would recommend to anyone who might be interested that you read what you can about Michael Collins. Michael Collins was the third astronaut on the on the Apollo trip to the moon that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin made. And they were together on the moon, but he was alone in the uh, command module. And he, uh, he experienced a kind of solitude a quarter of a million miles away from any other human being out of radio contact because he was on the dark side of the moon. And the effect that that had on him uh, the profoundly dis destabilizing effect that that had on him um, mm -hmm. is interesting to read about as far as what, um, you know, they hadn't planned on that. No one had thought that through. They were all concerned about, about what Armstrong and Aldrin were going to do down on the moon's surface. And no one thought about what would happen to him. Uh, but it, it's a very interesting case study in, in solitude. Wow, there you go. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I think I'm afraid that we need to wrap up, um, you know, now. So thank you, everybody, for um, presenting, for being here. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Natalie, for uh, hosting and, and running all the technicality and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank have you. Good, have a good one. If you would like to, just a, a quick note, thank you, everyone. If you would like to... Uh, continue to mingle. We do have the mingle function. Just a reminder, like I've said in every panel, it is awkward, but it is available. And now that we all know each other, it's significantly less awkward. <laughs> I be so, that somebody is looking for a bourbon, you know, uh, partner. Um, uh, well, you know, bourbon will be flowing in your respective homes and you can talk about it in the mingle function. Also, uh, the recordings should be up next week you know charlie will be working on those as quickly as possible and uh, if you would like papers i think everyone's contact information is should be listed on the website if you'd like to uh, reach out and continue conversation um we can be solitary but not lonely hopefully <laughs> and do <laughs> send them very much do Thank send you. them in to tuan so that he can publish them so these were excellent papers so super follow them up you have to review them, right? Uh, you know, but but uh, but but uh, you know, uh, there's a good chance. Uh, I, I think. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. all. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mark, are you there? I'm just gonna uh, close the whole room. Maybe you've stepped away from the computer, that happens. I'm just gonna close the room. You have a good one.